so it seems clear that post-pandemic there is perhaps a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to improve the global economy through a greener approach. But just who is going to drive that change? Well, joining me now from Nairobi is Inga Anderson, the Executive Director of the UN Environment Programme. Uh, Inga, where does creating greener economies come in your list of priorities? Oh, it's right up there at the top. Let's think about it. Uh, as you rightly say, once in a lifetime, how often do you see $20 trillion uh, from the public purse being poured into the global economy to jumpstart it and to prevent um, further economic decline? That is not something that we see often and certainly not uh, uh, as frequently as we are now seeing governments making the approval of these stimulus packages. So the question is then whether we're willing to use these funds smartly. So who's going to make that decision? Everyone is going to have to make this decision. And it means that, yes, we need to do the immediate bailouts, cut checks for people who have lost their jobs, the immediate sort of getting money into people's pockets actions. But thereafter come the opportunities of investing. And we are seeing it already. But because when we understand that, you know, half of our GDP relies on the environment in some sort, sense or shape or form, when do we understand that 7 million people die prematurely because of dirty air? When we understand what climate change is, is bringing to us if we do not take action, we have a real opportunity. We can continue on this gray, uh, dirty investment path or we can flip to green. You have in the past described nature uh, as an asset, natural capital, uh, you've called it. But that asset, when you call it an asset, conjures up something like an advantage for business. And that's a tricky balance for business against the environment, isn't it? Because the priority for business is a balance sheet. Yes, but we need to understand that nature is part and parcel of our everyday life, including business. Uh, and so it's not an either or, uh, you just can't pollute your way to wealth. Uh, you can't sort of extract, emit and cut down and, and exhaust nature for its plenties and assume that nature will continue uh, giving in the same generous way that it did when you were uh, extracting and emitting. So the truth is, I think that many businesses are realizing that you can, you can, you can overdo uh, too many chemicals into the environment, you will get a bumper harvest, but you need to make sure that you balance what you do to nature. So understanding that, and yes, nature is an asset class, of course it is. It provides the water we drink, the food we eat, the air we breathe, and it provides the very systems that regulate our weather. So let's understand that that asset class has, has value. It's not about putting dollar signs on trees and thinking that that's what it is. Well, it's that's what a lot of countries do. It, yes, but it's much broader than something as simplistic as that. It is understanding that each economy is underpinned by a flourishing, um, lush nature. And our very existence is underpinned by that nature. Our weather patterns, as I said, is underpinned by huge tropical forests, uh, ocean currents, etc. And having that understanding and therefore that you can't mess with it and assume that harvest will follow harvest and that's, that rains will follow rains. These kind of assumptions we understand now are, cannot be taken for granted. You talk with great enthusiasm, quite rightly, you are after all the UN Environment Programme. Um, but do you have any force, any sway to persuade governments to go greener? Governments that want to look towards the future of their countries are already seeing that these shifts are inevitable. Companies that want to secure um, the earnings of their shareholders in the quarter be beyond the present, looking a little deeper into the future, understanding this. And certainly the next generation of voters are understanding this. My point here is that where you see governments that are deeply steeped in an economy that is based on the current setting, yes, it is difficult but it is nearly an inevitable shift that we are having to do. So I'm a realist, but my job is to hold everybody's feet to the fire with science, with knowledge, 
And with the knowledge that the science is telling a certain thing that policy shifts therefore must follow. I'm sorry to sound a bit banal, but it does often, Inga, as you know, come down to money. Uh, and many industries that aren't necessarily environmentally friendly pay a lot of taxes to their governments. Uh, if the governments <laughs> are not taking those taxes, where's the money going to come from to create the green economies of the world? Well, let's look at, let's just take the country where we, you know, happen to be based. We have seen a country over two decades investing in renewable energy, investing in geothermal, investing in smart um, uh, infrastructure, IT infrastructure, investing in liberalizing um, uh, telecommunications, etc., and investing in wind energy. We know that per, per kilowatt hour, solar is much cheaper than coal in many settings where you have high solar radiation, ditto for wind. Uh, so we understand that governments, of course, they need to have their revenue. But we also know that the job content, as well as the tax revenue of these new businesses, are quite significant. And so it's not about going uh, cold turkey. It is about doing this, but doing this within the plans of the national determined contributions, which are these plans that countries are submitting to live up to Paris. Some countries have seen very positive visual uh, environmental impacts in their regions as a result of lockdowns, better air quality, uh, perhaps uh, fewer greenhouse gas emissions, cleaner waters. How can you ensure that this moment in time goes on for a little longer and people don't go back to the old status quo? The fact that people all of a sudden had seen blue skies, I think the fact that the people, people all of a sudden have seen wildlife emerge where they didn't know there was wildlife, that they've heard birdsong in the morning as they're drinking their coffee for the first time because they used to hear traffic or whatever these many, many stories that we've heard, I think that that will make people aware that shift is possible. Um, now, um, COVID has also meant that more people are taking their cars and public transport. So we also have to understand that as we begin to emerge from lockdown, we need to retrofit our public uh, infrastructure such that it is considered safe. But having said that, I think the awareness that it is not inevitable that you live in a fog of dirty air, um, that you can actually experience a different type of life and that you can leave that to your children. I think that's fairly significant. Inga Anderson, Executive Director of the UN Environment Programme, many thanks for joining us on the agenda. Thank you so much. My pleasure.